we need help. Every year we're getting further and further behind. And they just say it's not important for them to fix it. We have more important things to do other than your house. Here, up there, I just cleaned it up two weeks ago. I need them to fix all this. It could have been prevented all this. They would have listened to me the first time. It's a betrayal. It's a betrayal of trust as far as I'm concerned. They had a fiduciary responsibility to provide housing for First Nations people on this earth. Who owns the houses, the First Nation, or the government is disputed? Who owns the house, the person who lives in it, or the First Nation is also a disputed? When are you going to help out, Carolyn Bennett? Stop treating us like we're shadow. Unreserved housing in Canada seems to be in a kind of never-ending crisis. To the point sometimes that even new reserve homes have problems. My flooring here where all the water was. Okay. And it's coming through the, all the baseboards here, all the way through. Even it drips right there. This is discoloring because of that. And this is the water that's coming through the floor. And you could feel it every time you walk through it. Yeah, and when you, when you press your foot there. It's water. And all along here. This house is 18 months old. All along the baseboards here. It is growing up. We keep washing it with Javix here to, go, to make it look. But it's still, it's not going nowhere and I believe this is where all the water is going into the ductwork through here this vent that's where all the water is entering into the ductwork that's in the basement the problems with Bernice McKenzie's new home may be on the extreme end of the spectrum but they are rooted in systemic issues that have plagued First Nations housing since the federal government took the driver's seat in the 1930s Mackenzie lives in Lake St. Martin First Nation. After being flooded in 2011 due to water being diverted to protect Winnipeg, the community was eventually relocated. But Lake St. Martin community members spent years in Winnipeg hotels and other temporary homes. It was kind of horrible because along the way I lost my granddaughter into uh, going into hotels and being introduced to alcohol and drugs and I'm still healing in that part and and to have young children to be brought to Winnipeg and then I, that's where this, this that was the reason why I didn't want to move to Winnipeg is to raise them in Winnipeg I knew how Winnipeg was so and I wanted to move to the reserve and then to retire and then retire with my grandchildren and have a home for them in 2017, new, ready-to-move homes began arriving at Lake St. Martin First Nation, and Mackenzie moved into her new home on March 2nd, 2018. I was excited. I was really happy. Finally, I'm going to retire now and with my grandchildren, because I'm still raising my grandchildren, and I'm still fighting for them. But a month or two after moving in, Mackenzie began hearing a noise inside her master bedroom wall. The gushing water. It, at, at the beginning it was slow, you can hear it slowly, but now it's just like a water tap. Incredibly, Mackenzie says a leak in a water pipe connected to her shower head just ran and ran and ran. Watch your feet. You should have wore your shoes yeah. on. 
And this is where all the water is built up and through here. And this is where it's really soft. So this must be the where it's really leaking. Yeah, yeah that's where it is. That's yeah. where it's soft. Yeah. yeah, it's like paper there. I can easily just stick my finger right through there. All over her floors. And it's ruining all the flooring. Look at all, it's turning brown. It has buckled my floor all the way here. The water was up to up to here when I got them to shut the water off. Right up to here. And now that this washroom here is starting to do the same problem through the through the water and through the baseboards, it's called crawling, the coloring. And then right here, and it's bubbling up here. It's all around the frame. And ultimately, into the crawl space. See, I don't know where this water is all coming from, why it's reaching way over here, there. I'm not sure if that's mold there or. Hmm. I try to do that one. How long has this been going on? This has been going on over a year, guarantee over a year, and I've been telling them, but it's kind of leaking all over. Look at this, this, this thing here is leaking. That my furnace duct work up here, it's leaking. That's the duct work, or the heating. So, and this is what I was kind of worried about, and I've been telling them that there was a leak. And now, I need them to fix all this. It could have been prevented, all this, if they had listened to me the first time. Okay. It was only after she told the band that APTN Investigates had been out to see the situation in her house that they finally came and fixed the leak. APTN Investigates contacted Lake St. Martin First Nation Chief Adrian Sinclair and told him what our story was about. But he didn't get back to us when asked for an interview. This is the condition of housing on reserve. So here. Coming up, we hear from an academic who says the on-reserve housing system has been broken from the beginning. With all of the new money projected to be spent on reserve housing, how can it be that these conditions are still regular fodder for the news cycle? This overview from Indigenous Services Canada reveals the federal government was projecting spending of $675.6 million on reserve housing between April 2016 and June 2019. The department also reveals that the need is still great, according to First Nations who responded to the department with their housing needs. In fact, this overview shows that the number of units that need replacement has grown over the last nine years. Also, 22,788 units required major renovations in the 2017-2018 fiscal year. So what is wrong with the system? Sylvia Olson was a longtime housing manager on Sartlip First Nation in BC. She also wrote a history of on-reserve housing programs for her PhD dissertation at the University of Victoria. Olson says it's been broken for a long time. And it all started when the government got involved in housing during the Great Depression. The mainstream Canadian population off-reserve saw a market system with new ways to borrow money and generate wealth. While on-reserve housing was set up as a welfare system. A welfare system uh, can never provide houses. And all the way along through the whole history of 
housing on reserve since the 30s, there was never a time when anybody in government ever thought it would work. Um, it, the, the assumption was is that it didn't work because, in fact, you and I could figure out here in two minutes that a welfare delivery model for housing to an entire population uh, simply can't work, um, and it didn't. But if the government knew it wasn't going to work, then what were they expecting to happen to First Nations people? So up until the 30s, when this system started to get its wheels, Canada completely and utterly assumed that Indigenous people were dying out. So the root of this system that I study, and that we're actually living out today, is based in the idea that Indigenous people were not going to survive as a people, so that this could be more like a temporary fix. It was the underlying notion in Canada at that time. And that they put this kind of system in place is evidence that they weren't looking long term and they weren't looking for solutions that were really going to work. As well, Olson says yeah. the creation of a separate housing system for Indigenous people was largely a result of the Indian Act. Well, the Indian Act kind of prescribes that that's the case because on reserve you couldn't, we thought, we thought, you couldn't borrow money. The system that was coming into place in Canada was all about allowing folks to access enough money to build a house. So on reserve, it was just assumed that First Nations couldn't borrow money on the reserve. So now it had to be a government supply of housing. APTN <laughs> investigates requested an interview with a spokesperson from the Indigenous Services Department, but they declined. Olson says another factor in the long-term failure of government-run reserve housing is the nebulous legal status of First Nations home ownership. In the Indian Act, a reserve is defined as land held by the Crown for the band. So if the Crown owns the land, who owns the houses? Who owns the houses on reserves is still a question. Has anybody, uh, now the government might say, um, or the, um, yeah, the Indian Department might have said that the First Nations own those houses, um, but in truth, it's, it's a disputed, it's a disputed uh, question, and it is to this day. And even, so, who owns the houses, the First Nation or the government is disputed, and on many, 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 if not most First Nations, who owns the house, the person who lives in it, or the First Nation is also a disputed. Uh, so this system that I call it, um, is not very systematic at all, and there's a whole lot of these really fundamental questions that are left unanswered, which is why there's a lot of chaos in how to manage this housing stock. For Bernice McKenzie, ownership is a factor in why she hasn't made a move on her own to get her pipe fixed. If it was my house, then you know, it, I would have. Uh, I would have had that done, but this is ban own houses, so and they're insured, so I'm not sure. Feeling as though a home is not one's own to fix is part of what is wrong with indigenous housing. But there is another factor at play, devolution. You see, this this is what I was talking about about quality control of storage of materials. Oh, you know, drywall here. Alan Isfeld is a member of Weiwei Sakapo First Nation a Red Seal carpenter, a former building inspector for the city of Winnipeg, and a former building materials salesman. He's worked extensively on reserve construction projects. And nowadays, Isfeld consults on mold remediation. For him, something that happened in 1996 is key in understanding many of the problems we see in Indigenous housing today. Prior to 1996, all houses built on reserve and off reserve were subject to the same mandate. In other words, you had to have journeyman tradesmen building these homes, you had to have bonds, you had to have performance bonds, material bonds, and, and everything else. You had to meet code requirements uh, besides the CMHC inspection requirements. But after 1996, when they offloaded that responsibility onto the backs of the First Nations, and uh, everything went to uh, hell in a handbasket, so to speak, because now you've got people who aren't qualified, who were never given the qualifications, who weren't properly informed of what they were taking over. Isfeld says after 1996, 
bands were handed the responsibility of making sure building code requirements were met. And in this email to APTN Investigates, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation outlines how its on-reserve, non-profit housing program handles code enforcement. CMHC is not a regulatory agency, the email reads, and the First Nation is responsible for enforcing compliance with building codes and standards. Adding that the CMHC requires the First Nation to certify building code compliance at three stages in the construction process. But Isfeld says this process is not about assuring quality. It has to advance CMHC's payments, not to advance the quality of construction on the house. There's a difference. So there's no one out there right now that are, is guaranteeing the quality for the construction of the homes built on most reserves. And Isfeld isn't alone in his assessment of CMHC's code certification process. When APTN Investigates visited Dakota Plains First Nation to talk about housing, band CEO Craig Blacksmith echoed Isfeld. The inspectors that come out and inspect do superficial inspections. They don't actually get into the, uh, the construction of the house. It's more of a inspection for a progress payment. Isfeld says another area where quality suffers is in the transport and storage of materials. Up until uh, uh, just recently, uh, the building materials that were delivered to the north from various various companies, when they deliver them there in the winter road, they travel up on the winter road and uh, there's moisture splashing on the building materials and they're offloaded on the ground. And they sit there for three or four months before the construction season actually starts in those communities. So the houses that they're building are basically instantly subjected to mold you know, as a result of that. And then if you don't have journeyman tradesmen building the homes, uh, and the people that are applying the product, the finished product to the home, don't realize that what they're installing is already mold infested. Well, it's just a matter of time before the, the house is deteriorated to a point where you can't live in it anymore. Isfeld says the situation is improving when materials are being transported. From my understanding is that now a lot of the suppliers, a lot of the suppliers, not all of the suppliers, but a lot of the suppliers are willingly shipping materials in containers, you know, to try to protect this issue of the mold and everything else. But it's a little late. Storage remains a big issue. Oh, there's communities in the north right now that are at the level where they don't have any quality control over the materials still because the government refuses to give them money or storage facilities to properly control, contain those materials and keep them from the weather. Now if they had any type of storage facility where they could put those building materials off the ground in a dry place, that would reduce the uh, mold content in these homes significantly. And while some might argue that with devolution the federal government is trying to deal with the reserves on a nation-to-nation -nation basis, Isfeld sees it differently. The chief and councils, I think, were blindsided because they envisioned now that they were in control of something when really they weren't. They were given the dollars to purchase materials on their own, but the government never gave them the tools. They never gave them the material or to... to uh, to store or you know storage facilities for the material, they never gave them the training that was required right off the bat. Saying, "Okay, uh, we, we want to adopt an industry standard for the First Nations across Canada for building code requirements for building homes." So what you're talking about essentially is one system for the rest of Canada and one system for houses that are being on reserves. Correct. You're a First Nations man. Yes. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel. It's a betrayal. It's a betrayal of trust. It's a breach of trust as far as I'm concerned. Trust is, of course, a central idea in any discussion of relations between Indigenous people and the federal government. And for Dakota Plains CEO Craig Blacksmith, that trust is fundamental to understanding everything. Blacksmith draws on the Government of Canada's famous 1969 Statement on Indian Policy, also known as the White Paper. And in here, on page 12, it states very clearly that the Indian Act, it says that it is a trust. As long as this trust exists, the government, as trustee, 
or supervise the business connected with the land. As a trustee, you're supposed to make sure that your children are looked after or your wards are looked after properly. Putting them in a situation where they're living in, in uh, unlivable conditions, that's you know, a violation of any trust law anywhere. As Craig Blacksmith sees it, that trust has never worked. So it's time we abolish the Indian Act. We take that fraternal structure away completely. We administer our own resources, which includes the land. If we were allowed to conduct business just like anybody else, I guarantee we would fix this housing problem on our own. But we need the resources to do that. Coming up next week on Healing Housing Part 2, we'll hear about a systemic shift being proposed that isn't about abolishing the Indian Act. The point is for the government to get out of delivering these services. If there is one answer, get out. And we will also look at housing among the first people of Canada's north, where the situation is as desperate, if not more, than in the south. Old abandoned boats like that, you can see people's belongings in them. There's quite a few personal belongings in there, lots of sleeping bags under that boat too. Elders are known to crawl under that, out of that boat every day. Here, up there. I just cleaned it up two weeks ago. My spouse got rashes, maybe from the mold, so many times. And nothing ever healed.